Um, I'd like to welcome now Sarah Komarninsky to um, talk a little bit about um, a different part of the hospital which wasn't about healthcare necessarily. She's going to speak a little bit about the arts and crafts that were created at the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, um, and, and thank you everyone. It's really nice to be here um, with, with those of you from far away and, uh, and from nearby. I'm, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to be here and share a bit of my research so far with you. Um, and so first I wanted to talk a little bit just about um, how I started working on this project anyway. Um, uh, I, I grew up here in Alberta, um, in, in Treaty 6 territory, and I've, I've been lucky to live here and many generations of my family, and I'm thankful for that. It's beautiful there, so I put this picture up. Um, but I went away to school, um, and most recently I studied at uh, UBC in Vancouver. And while I was writing my dissertation, I also took on some part-time work here in Edmonton. I moved back to finish writing. Um, and that work was at a place called the Tuberculosis Program Evaluation and Research Unit at the University of Alberta. And there I learned that tuberculosis is still a problem for some indigenous communities in Canada. And I began to learn about the colonial history that led to tuberculosis epidemics among indigenous peoples and the legacy of the hospital system that was, that was established to try to do something about it. So since I was living here in Edmonton, but going back and forth to Vancouver at that time for school, I came across some pieces from the Kamsel Hospital at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver. And these are some of, uh, some of those objects. Once I started looking, I found art and craft made by patients at the Kamsel and other hospitals like it all over the country. Um, and the Royal Alberta Museum uh, has the most extensive collection by far, um, over 400 art crafts and medical objects from the Charles Campbell Hospital. And I, and I have to acknowledge um, the work of Ruth McConnell, who's here today, um, and Annalisa Staples, who, who put together a really beautiful catalog about that collection. Um, anyhow, um, people also have art and craft from the hospitals in their own collection, and I have even heard that they can be found at garage sales here in Edmonton. And so the more I learned, the more questions I had, like why were people making art and craft at the hospital? How did this art and craft end up in the museums? And where else did, did it go? Um, how do hospital handicrafts relate to other kinds of making? And what do these art and craft objects mean today? And what do the families of the people who made those things think about all, all of that? Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> So I'm fortunate to have a position right now um, at, at the university to try to answer some of those questions. And in the rest of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things I've learned about uh, the handicrafts program at the Kamsel specifically. So the occupational therapy or handicrafts program at the Kamsel was established in 1946. So right after the, the hospital was opened. Um, and it said that the program was established to help patients keep to their treatment schedules, uh, to keep busy, during the long months and even years in hospital. And many people, uh, depending what stage they were at in their treatment, they would be confined to bed um, pretty much all of the time. Um, and so, um, so keeping busy was, was something um, that, that was valued. Um, so patients carved in wood and stone, uh, they beaded, painted, tooled leather, sewed clothing, made blankets, dolls, and moccasins, knitted, crocheted, and made many other things. Um, some even made photo albums out of old x-rays. And this is Douglas Lord um, in, in, uh, with a bunch of handicrafts. Uh, he also uh, purchased objects to, uh, for the University of Alberta's own collection, so that's another link to the University of Alberta, and the University of Alberta has a small collection of, of pieces from the Council Hospital also. So anyway, handicrafts weren't on, only something for patients to do, they were also something to sell. And the hospital sold items through the occupational therapy department at first, and later opened um, a gift shop, operated a gift shop. At the same time, staff also worked to expand markets and find other venues to sell patients' work. So art and crafts from the hospital won, won prizes at the Edmonton Exhibition and the Calgary Stampede. Um, they were sold in Banff and Vancouver, and custom orders for art and craft were taken in by the department and filled by the patients. Money made from the sale of the handicrafts was used to support the occupational therapy department, um, but apparently patients received a portion of the sale of their work. 
So art and craft made in hospitals like the Cancel can tell another kind of story by focusing on particular objects and their circulation, their movement um, through different contexts. So for example, consider this soapstone carving. It was carved at the Cancel by James Tagiapak from Cambridge Bay, actually. Um, and he was at the hospital for longer than any other patient uh, at the Cancel, 11 years. During that time, he completed at least 608 carvings of wood and stone, nine of which are at the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton, and two of which are at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, including this one. And so it's possible to trace the biography of a carving like this, who made it, where it was made, the materials it was made from, and where it circulated, to show the links between hospitals, institutions, markets, and individuals. And aside from that, I also find the subject matter very moving. I do not know how Tegia Pak would have described this carving or his experience in the hospital. Maybe it evokes a scene from home and a way of life he hoped to return to. When I look at this carving of wood and soapstone and string, I also see a bird lured into a trap, carved by a man confined to a hospital far away um, from his community and culture for over a decade. So, of course, patients would have come to the hospital knowing how to make things as well, and it seems that they may have accessed materials, sold items, or gifted art and craft through their own networks, both inside and outside the hospital. So this is a section of uh, what's called the Ward News from the Camsel Arrow, which was the, the magazine produced um, at the hospital, a bi-monthly magazine. Um, patients in each ward contributed information, stuff like thanking the staff for their care, um, reporting on patients who recently arrived or left the ward, um, saying hello to friends and family, um, and also writing about who was keeping busy while in hospital. And so um, some people here talked about um, someone's keeping busy knitting, doing beadwork, and um, doing embroidery. And I also recently met a nurse who did her training in tuberculosis care at the Camsel for a year in 1948. And when I interviewed her, she still remembered how she used to greet the patients in Inuktitut. And she also told me that one of the Inuit patients said that if the nurse brought in materials for her, um, she would make her a doll. So the nurse brought in her own childhood dresses uh, for the patient to make a doll out of, along with scraps from her old fur coat. And I expect there are more stories like this um, about things people made and how the relationships between people in the hospital, um, here nurse and patient, are wrapped up with material objects like a doll. So I've got the same image as Maureen, um, because there are, there are kind of two Camsel hospitals as I see it. There were literally two hospitals, the old one and the new one, um, the old one torn down for the modern one that stands today. And there was also kind of the hospital that represented the federal government's attempt to stop a tuberculosis epidemic, fulfill a responsibility to provide health care to Aboriginal peoples, a hospital supposedly designed to help and to heal, to train a generation of health care workers, and to show off as a model of care for Northern peoples. But there's also the hospital that was an instrument of assimilation, a site of broken promises, a place of pain, lost life, lost relatives, and a loss of culture and language. Patients may not, know, not have known where they're being sent or why they were being sent there, and many never came home. So Tegiapak's bird, the nurse's doll, and other art and craft like it, I think, can give us the opportunity to celebrate the bright beauty of the art created by residents of these hospitals. But it can also um, help us to acknowledge some of those dark truths. And so maybe, um, in a small way, art and craft can bring these versions of the hospital together, entangling lives and institutions and even materials, right? String and wood and stone and cloth. Help to link family members, um, people to their family members taken away. Help people learn about the hospital system and the ongoing impact of TB today. Some might take action to help make healthcare more equitable. There are likely many more reasons why art and craft is important today, and I'm looking forward to learning more about it as I continue this research. Thank you.